So we are uh, running with about 25 minutes ahead of schedule, which is kind of odd for us. It's usually the other way around. Uh, so next up, uh, we have the Burlington Electric Department with Jennifer Green and Darren Springer talking about building electrification policy recommendations. Uh, uh, before we get into that, do you want to give an update, survey on the uh, Public Works Commission, since we're getting kind of some informal commission updates? All right, thanks. Should I go sit over there? Yeah. Since I'm here, I might as well, uh, I guess, give you a comment about that while we have time. Again, my name is Solvay Overby. I've been on the Public Works Commission for quite a few years. But um, and I've usually handed out a handout because a lot of people don't really understand exactly what the Public Works Commission does and what the Public Works Department does comparatively. So if anybody does have an interest in that, please come find me and I'll, I can help you out with that. Um, the, the Public Works Commission has a few things right now, I think, on the agenda for next week. One of the um, items is going to be uh, adding in the bike lanes, two lane, two directions for Plattsburgh Avenue. Uh, that would be one of the one of the the few uh, responsibilities that the Public Works Commission has is dealing with parking, which team, tends to be a lot of what's on our agenda lately. You know, removing a spot, moving a spot things like that, but one of the items on next Wednesday's um, agenda. And Public Works Commission, just backing up a bit, the Public Works Commission meetings are always on the third Wednesday of the month, 6.30. They're at the uh, the Public Works Commission meeting down on Pine Street. You can also watch online because they are uh, live streamed. But next week, uh, the, 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 the item that is probably the most interest is the, pub, the uh, bike lanes on Plattsburgh Avenue, which would mean we would be voting to remove parking on the west side of Plattsburgh Avenue, which is, uh, they've done a parking study. There's hardly ever anybody parking on that side of the street. So if you have an interest in that, you can watch that meeting. Uh, you can uh, send in an email to uh, the uh, Public Works Commission, we do have a guy that does all the communication stuff, but if you have an interest, my, my email address with the Public Works Commission is silverb at burlingtonvt.gov. If anybody has any questions about other things public works related, um, they are going to do an update on the North Winooski Avenue bike lane change, which has been somewhat challenging for people to work out all the details of where people park if we do not have parking on uh, the east side of North Winooski. So that will be an information item on Wednesday. Um, I haven't read that part of the packet. I just got it today. So I'm just starting to read, prepare. Does anybody have any questions about anything generally, Park Public Works Commission or Public Works Department or next week's meeting? I, we're always looking for somebody to, to, to participate in that commission. So if anybody's interested, there'll be elections next next June. And so it would be nice people can start participating in the meetings and you can get an idea of how it works. I'm more than willing to mentor people if they're interested. You had a question? This one? When is University Place going to be open? Because the construction on that was finished four weeks ago and they just repainted all, they painted all the lines, but the little cones are still blocking the road. I, I haven't been told that. The question is, when will the university place renovation? It's, it's the construction ended four weeks ago or so. Yeah, I want to hear this. Oh. Uh, yeah, the question is, the university place is the street that goes uh, across the east side of the green on, on the UVM campus. And it's been closed in order to uh, make it more of a pedestrian friendly area. And it also is gonna be one way only, it's not gonna be able to be driven both directions. Uh, and I bet we can find the answer to that at the meeting next Wednesday. That's something that I can ask. We have a, commu com a commissioner communication. So if there are questions that the community has, usually people ask me to bring them up at that meeting or make a comment about a problem. Um, uh, yeah, I, I I haven't paid attention to that to know. And I'm wondering if there's, I don't know what they're waiting on. 
but I, I can I can ask that question. And if you want, I can find out and email you that. If you want to give me your email address, I can find that out for you and email you. Thanks. Anybody else? The public works is just so interesting. However, I have to tell you, it is the foundation of our of our of our civilization. So it's not a small thing, even though, you know, sewers and clean water and uh, your streets, all of these things, the parking isn't so exciting, but the, but the water, wastewater, storm water, all of those are really important. And all of that is discussed during these meetings. So I, I encourage anybody to watch those meetings. And I also encourage people that are interested in actually making decisions to help build the infrastructure and make sure our infrastructure can be a, is affordable and can be maintained participate in that. It's really an important commission and an important department. And they, they do a great job. Uh, there's a small staff. I do have my my um, difficulties sometimes being in the minority on some of the you know decisions that are made, but I all you can do is try to inform people. And if the decision is what it is, it is what it is. So I encourage people to pay attention to that very important commission, a very important department in, in Burlington. Thank you, Solvay. Okay, I think at this point we're going to move on to the presentation uh, from BED. So without further ado, let me introduce Jennifer Green and Darren Springer. Thank you. Take that one. Hi, everybody. I am joined right on time by my colleague, Jennifer Green. <laughs> So, uh, you want to Thank you. 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 The ground transportation sector that builds environment. And as you know, this is exciting because it's all part of our net zero energy strategy, which is coming on the coattails of our 2014 renewable energy, renewable energy stats. So, as you may all know, 2014 we became the first city in the country to support 100% of our uh, electricity from renewables. So, now we're moving on to net zero. And now we have a charge from the city council to look beyond some of the things that we need to incentivize people to move towards that zero, i.e., putting our things for the income and electric vehicles and cars, et cetera, to make it a cost. Because the city council, I think we all know that there's only so much we can do with protecting a lot of people for it and, and um, some of them. Financial incentive that we offer. We probably need some policy there. So, we think it's not going to start taking back again from recommendation time. Policy for the building fire for buildings. So, I'm here with Darren. I guess Darren gets the meeting of the evening tonight to talk a little bit about uh, what we're thinking vis a vis a building electrification policy for large scale buildings. But what we're really interested in in the next 20 minutes. Beyond um, sort of their giving the update is to your thoughts about um, what we're considering to propose. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's keep uh, it's great to be here with everybody uh, in the room. Let's see, such a beautiful folks. Um, uh, we read the board in 28 last night, um, and we're going around all the NPAs to talk about uh, what really stems from a vote that the community had back in 2021, Town Meeting Day. Uh, we had 65% of the community vote yes uh, to authorize the charter change uh, that would give the city ability to regulate emissions and buildings. Um, the governor and the legislature approved that earlier this year. And so uh, in May, the city council passed a resolution that Jen mentioned, uh, asking us and the Department of Permitting and looking at policy options to expand upon some of the work that we've done over the past few years. Uh, we have mental weatherization standards that are already in effect. Uh, we have a new construction requirement that you put in a renewable heating system uh, when you're building new. So everything we're doing now is to build on those existing requirements. And uh, a couple things we're thinking about, and then we'd love to take your questions or your feedback. 
Um, on new construction, we're thinking about going beyond just the heating system and saying, if you're going to build a new building in Burlington, it has to be all renewable. And that means uh, it can have either a contract to renewable fuel if it has a conventional uh, system, or it can have uh, different options like geothermal or, or heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, uh, different types of technologies that basically use no fossil fuel. And we're talking about not just heating systems, but appliances, cooking, water heating, everything that would go on in a building. Uh, and this would be for starting in 2024. Uh, the second thing that we're thinking about with relative to larger existing buildings. Uh, we're talking about buildings that are over 50,000 square feet. There's maybe a couple hundred of those buildings uh, in the community. Uh, a lot of them are going to be with larger institutions like the medical center, UVM, the city, uh, government itself, the school district, and from college, uh, and then others as well. And saying if you're going to pull a permit, to replace a heating system, like the water heating system, one of those existing buildings, it has to be renewable as well. Um, so these are the new requirements. One feature that we're looking at is to say that if you can't meet that standard, either for new construction or for existing buildings, uh, we would use carbon pollution pricing. Uh, but really, for the first time, I think a community would have done this in Vermont and say that you would have to pay an alternative compliance fee that would look at the amount of carbon you'd be putting out from the heating system or the appliance uh, over the lifetime of that system and pay that impact fee up front. Um, and that would be a way to help level the playing field for the renewable technologies, for the cleaner technologies, uh, and a way to ensure that this cost of carbon is being accounted for uh, in the built environment and growing it. One of the exciting things is that other communities are looking at what we're doing and they're starting to move in the same direction. Uh, South Burlington recently uh, is in the process of adopting a similar uh, renewable heating requirement to what we adopted in Burlington in 2021. Um, and certainly there's a lot of conversation at the state level around these issues as well. So we just wanted to share some of what we're thinking. There's a report that we put out in July uh, that laid out a few different ideas around these issues and we're scheduled to uh, issue a final report to the council uh, that the council could take up in December and possibly if, if they're uh, in agreement with what we're proposing, there could be a vote to approve some of these items uh, in March of 2023. Uh, down the day. So we'll stop there. Love to have questions or feedback that you might have on what we're proposing here or sometimes we come to the day and get questions that are totally unrelated to the topic but maybe something you've been talking about uh, relative to the electric department. So uh, we'll stop there and take questions or your feedback. Anybody any questions for the folks from BED? I'd just like to know where can we get more information about it to read like what the proposal is. Um, so probably the best sort of information will be I don't know if it's on our yeah. Report and study the company. If you put it in the search bar, if you go if you go down to the points at the bottom of our webpage, page, mm -hmm. it was posted in the last couple of days. So it'll be Thank you. That's Berlin's electric time. Uh, my, quest, my question is, do you have a um, projection of how much additional electricity would be used by Burlington residents if we were to, say, have 25% of us using electric vehicles or 50% of us or 100% of us? Because I'm just curious as to how that might be factored into your planning if we all really did get electric vehicles and we're plugging them in and what would that do for our needs? No, that's a great question. Um, we do. We have done um, something called the net zero energy roadmap, um, which really looks at uh, what is the rate of new electricity away from fossil fuel towards uh, heat pumps, electric vehicles. And the projection is that if we're able to do that uh, fully, um, you would be having about 65% more electric use in the community. Uh, we'd be more efficient overall. We use less energy overall, and we certainly have less carbon emission. Um, and so part of what we've done is uh, in 2021, the community, and we thank you for this, uh, voted for a revenue bond uh, for Burlington Electric uh, called the Net Zero Energy Revenue Bond. And part of that funding is to prepare for in that future uh, to upgrade portions of the grid so that we have the ability to accommodate more customers uh, rolling electric vehicles, going to heat pumps, using uh, renewable electricity for, for the purpose of reducing fossil fuel use. Great question. That's also on our website, uh, RolandElectric.com. And if you put in slash NZE for net zero energy, uh, the report is right there. Uh,
Thank you, Darren. Um, I'll just project because I don't think that's on, um, but hi. hi. I and I don't, you know, mean be like a, a downer, but I'm very concerned about where some of the materials for all the electric batteries come from as a francophone, francophile, French teacher, and I'm well aware of the conflict of minerals issue and that a lot of that is mine, much like the blood diamond industry and people are exploited in African countries. And, you know, we see it in our devices that were marketed to update every six months. We don't really need to do. And I just, I hope that you all, you know, shed a light on sourcing from companies that are following legislation and policies that call for humane working conditions, because that's increasing. And I also, my other concern is, you know, I'm all about less energy use. And then I like hear the F-35s going over when I'm teaching and we're, and I'm like, how much carbon are they using? So how does all this local grassroots um, efforts you know, and I'm saying this like genuinely, like sometimes it's like, what, you know what I mean? Like, how does that dovetail with so much permit being skewed out into our environment? Like, I'm not sure, you know, and I know that's probably out of your work, but I hope the city is like, my city is bottling of those contradictions. You know, that we had the F-35s, that every time they fly, there's so much carbon spewed into our environment. So, I mean, what's the point of getting an electric car? So, I, I think everybody heard that, but kind of about the F-35 and also the materials and the batteries. Um, I think if some of this is outside of our purview, certainly. But, right. Um, uh, you know, the roadmap really focuses on ground transportation, you know, at least within the city, those are the big sources that we look at. Um, in terms of the battery materials, there's a couple pieces uh, of kind of new developments that are interesting. Uh, one is in the federal legislation that just passed, um, it actually has a pretty strong and increasing standard for the battery materials to be um, produced uh, in North America or in the United States, as opposed to uh, coming from elsewhere. The materials um, that go in, like all the yeah. chemicals that go in there. Yeah. So there's so it, to get the electric vehicle tax credit in the future is going to be dependent on where the materials are sourced. Uh, that's a big change uh, from from what it's been in the past. So it'll be interesting to see yeah, if that plays yeah, out. Yeah. We have some supply chain that's developed here um, relative to that. And then uh, the other thing is, is recycling materials. Um, finding a use after that battery is, is done in the vehicle. Uh, whether that's using it as a stationary energy storage source, we're using it that way. Or there's also a company uh, that I'm aware of in Nevada that thinks that they can get up to 15% of the uh, supply chain that we need from just recycling material in the batteries. It okay. So we're, we're interested in these developments. We, we don't have the ability necessarily to fully impact them uh, from rolling to electric, but we're sure. conscious of some of those.
solar, wind, biomass. So anytime you plug in, you are at, you are using renewable sources. So if this our installation is, is being plugged in an outlet, then you can be assured that it's coming from a renewable source. What we're really working on now is transitioning away from fossil fuels and inviting people to the grid, inviting uh, infrastructure to the grid that depends on, say, gasoline, cars, for example, buildings, which predominantly use natural gas. So I hope that answers your question. If, you're, if the installation requires electricity, then you're on the right path. You're supporting that. Quick question about uh, energy retrofits for um, heat pump water heaters and heat pumps. Um, obviously, in the old North End, we've got a lot of natural gas. And um, are you planning on expanding or um, or continuing um, the um, sort of the um, uh, um, incentives <laughs> for for the for that technology for replacements? I personally have um, using natural gas for uh, hot water and um, it's it's kind of tickling that uh, four thousand dollar mark for installation costs for uh, for just a water heater. So mm -hmm. I'm just curious. About it. But I'm also curious too with the new building uh, that's going up in the big hole, um, mm -hmm. whether that's been included in, in all this um, uh, and uh, the requirements for for that. Thank you. Yeah, no, two, two good questions. Um, in terms of incentives, uh, and I'm, I'm glad you brought them up because we should mention this everywhere we go. Um, we have great incentives uh, to switch to a heat pump, switch to a heat pump water heater uh, in your home. 95% I mean, of Burlington is, is on natural gas. And so there's a great opportunity to reduce fossil fuel use with heat pumps. Uh, we have great incentives. You can get up to 75% of the cost of a heat pump installation uh, rebated. Um, and then we also have, I think, over $1,000 off on the heat pump water heaters. Uh, those are all on our website. We're going to continue those. Uh, the revenue bond was in part to ensure that we had funding to continue uh, to offer those incentives over the next several years. And the other exciting piece there is that the federal bill is going to bring some new money uh, to help with that as well. So stay tuned. There could be more opportunities coming from the federal bill uh, as well. And then in terms of uh, new construction uh, downtown, um, that would be subject to this renewable heating uh, ordinance that we mentioned. So any new building going in and pulling the permit is going to need a, a renewable heating system. And then if this if this proposal here gets enacted, uh, then probably starting in 2024, it would have that all new construction has to be 100% renewable for all the thermal uses in the building. But currently, at least the heating system, which is the major uh, fossil fuel use in a typical building, has to be renewable. Yeah. Thanks for those questions. Okay, actually, so what you just said, it only concerns large buildings, not single family homes or duplexes. Yeah, so great, great observation. Uh, in terms of new construction, uh, those requirements apply across the board. But in terms of existing buildings, uh, the only thing we're looking at is, is large commercial or industrial scale buildings that are 50,000 square feet or above. No residential, no multifamily, uh, just commercial and industrial. But thank you for, for that question. I think, did, did you have a question as well? I have clarify here. You're saying like renewable appliances, and that means they're electric. And currently we're like 66% renewable energy in Vermont for the electric grid, and we were saying all, but it's not currently. Just wondering how we work, how we're working on the electric energy generation, not just the appliances. Yeah, no, great question. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> so, the question was in Vermont, we're roughly 66% renewable. Um, you know, how does that apply when we're thinking about appliances and building? So, in Burlington, we're 100% renewable. Um, so, we're ahead of the curve uh, when it comes to what the state is doing. Uh, the state itself is, is pretty far ahead of the rest of the country. 
Um, but in, in Burlington, since 2014, we've been 100% renewable. Uh, so all of the appliances that use electricity are also powered by 100% renewable. Um, and obviously, we, you know, there's a question earlier about solar. Like we love solar. We have a lot of new solar coming on in the community. Uh, we support that. We incorporate that into our our mix as well. But uh, we've been renewable since 2014, 100%. So the real question when you get to that point is, how do we get off of fossil fuel for uh, other uses, and can we rely on the grid for some of those uses? And that's kind of what we're what we're focused on. Um, and you know, there are other renewable fuels as well, but electricity in Burlington since 2014, 100% renewable. Any further questions for the motion, JP? This might not be a question for you. Early on, when the city place project was being proposed, there was uh, there was uh, the plan was to include the district heating, the problem with the meal plan. So I'm just wondering if that's still now, you know, it's gone through various, you know, new development agreement and other revised. Right. So the question is. Is that still the plan for the new current latest and greatest development? And, you know, you might not know the answer to that, but it's still the it's for the discussion. Yep. What they're going to use for electricity. So is it still just a heating plan for the new uh, construction of the city place? Whatever. No, great question. I, we can definitely speak to that. Um, so district heating, just for everybody's uh, benefit, is talking about taking uh, heat from the McNeil plant, which is an electric plant, and getting it up to some of the buildings that are using fossil fuel and using that renewable heat to displace fossil fuel. Uh, we've talked about it in the past uh, at the hospital, at UVM, at the downtown project as well. Um, the version that, that was going to go downtown was going to be a hot water loop uh, from District Energy. And when I became a general manager in 2018, we looked at this project and the, the better route was to essentially try to focus on the hospital and UVM and do a steam system as opposed to a hot water system. So we've gone through three different phases of feasibility. And then this summer, we had a letter agreement with Burlington Electric, the city, the hospital, UVM, the Intervale Center, which is also a partner, uh, and Vermont Gas. And we are in the process of trying to develop a steam-based system that would go from McNeil uh, to the hospital and do a significant amount of renewable thermal steam to the hospital, uh, move to a couple of different UVM buildings potentially, and then come back down the hill and help uh, heat some of the Intervale Center buildings as well. That's the current loop that we're looking at. The challenge with district heat uh, is, in terms of expanding it beyond that, is the price per mile of infrastructure is significant, and the load that we would pick up by going downtown is not enough to really justify the additional cost at this point in time. So right now, the concept is not to go to the city place project. Uh, they would have to have a renewable heating system that's separate from the district energy system. Molly? I have a policy question idea always on my mind. Um, has the city ever considered a requirement to have all these departments to be solar compatible or solar ready? Um, not that they would have to put solar on them, but they, they had buildings that could host solar sometime in the future. Just a little pet peeve in mind that you know, would be an institution that give them the evidence to be great solar you know, yeah, we, I don't, yeah, and, and we, we follow, it's a great question. Yeah, and it is. We follow the, um, the residential commercial energy code for the state, which is getting more and more stringent, and there's been conversation around that. Um, there's also a conversation around being electric vehicle ready, like mm -hmm. having the wiring for a charging station. Uh, a lot of new buildings are putting solar up, but it's a great point. Like when we think about solar in Burlington, uh, we don't have big open fields where we can put panels like they do elsewhere in the state. So uh, using our rooftops, using our built environment is really critical. Um, and even if they don't put it in, there are a lot of times after the fact, developers want to come and talk to them about, if you have a flat roof, we love to put solar on the roof. Um, so we'll we'll share that with the folks on our team who work on energy code. It's a good, good question. Yeah. Is there any further questions you can do? Well, I'm going to put on my hat at the downtown. I would just say that I recently had an opportunity to interact with one of the crews from the BED doing the work on college. I just want to say that they did a very good job with that. Um, it's very well executed. I received a letter in the mail, and I think it was a week or two ahead of time. We knew it was coming. 
Um, and I kind of felt that was the way things should work. And we could see that very friendly and explain what they were doing. And um, at this point, just glad the work is over. I appreciate that. We'll get that comment. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you all for, for having us here. Really and yeah, yeah good question. Yes. Last talk. Thank you. Okay. Hey, um, so I appreciate the comments about rooftop solar, but I saw the team that's up for you. I saw down at the airport, you uh, were demonstrating a new wind turbine. Yeah. Can you talk to us about the um, cost comparative? Because we're talking about small um, groups. That size wind turbine does it generate more electricity than a, an array of panels that you put on there for that? Yeah. No, thanks for the question. Uh, so we, we had a um, announcement uh, was a week ago at the airport. Uh, we have 500 kilowatt solar project at the airport, and then we have this new thing called it's called the Arc Turbine Orb, uh, O R B, and it looks kind of like a beach ball that's kind of turning slowly. Um, it's eight feet tall. It's a vertical axis wind turbine, and we met this company that from Massachusetts uh, through a local business accelerator program. And the idea is, and we're kind of doing a test run for a year to prove this out, that it could produce uh, up to two and a half times as much energy uh, per watt as solar can. Uh, and wind obviously produces at different times of the day, different times of the year. Um, so there's a complementary aspect to having a rooftop wind turbine as well as rooftop solar. So uh, right now that unit costs $20,000. It's the first one ever in production. And we're testing it for a year. And their goal, they said at the announcement, was to get it down to $7,000. And if they could get a three kilowatt, $7,000 wind turbine that produces two and a half times as much as solar, I think it'd be a very attractive option for rooftops around the city. And it can actually go in with solar or it can be in lieu of solar. Um, and it would really diversify our resource mix in terms of what we can build in the city. So um, I'm really optimistic that we'll get some good data, hopefully, and maybe it could be a partnership where we see more of these uh, around the community. But uh, stay tuned. We'll have more data, hopefully, in a year from now to be able to, you know, uh, say if it works well. Yeah. I think it's a great idea. I mean, landlords love to be able to utilize the rooftop page. They will put a on their fixed bag. So, I mean, if, they, if we can try and bring some energy to end through natural resources, I think it's possible. Anyone who's over at the airport, if you go up to, I think it's the fifth level, the top of the garage, uh, you'll see our solar panels on one side, and you can see the orb uh, hopefully turning when you're there. Uh, and uh, I think it's visible maybe from the street level as well, but it's a, it's a neat technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that question. All right, thank you, Derek. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Thank you, everybody. Uh, before uh, we turn the topic over to the department, I give my call back to Solar Commission deadline on day regarding the question about the university place. Yeah, I was just going to say, I did get a text back on your Chase Center, but we're going to He said that the university place uh, section is going to open on the next week. We're just doing the final line. You know, next week is when we get it. And you saw that. Okay, we're going to be moving on to the new parts of the culture. We've got a call for work here from Burlington, New York, so I'm going to invite you to come on in. Great to have this. I know that there are folks here from the community uh, that have uh, come out for this topic. Uh, so when they go to the presentation, we need to get a question from here. It's important that you can find your mind to please state your name, please stop, and then we're going to let you look for free and get on the street here. Comfortable with that. Uh, and we'll we'll sort of take a discussion from there. Uh, we can put aside that I'm going to put the details. Uh, we'll also have a good discussion here about the time mark is not important. Uh, yes, I have a whole, a whole panel here. Yeah. So I guess uh, you go through the introduction styles and, and then I'll let you get moving with the presentations. Um, just a little technical glitch. Um, we have two presenters um, online, and they cannot hear when the questions come from this microphone. So I don't know how to manage that. I think what I'll do is I'll just have to float around and speak this microphone and let Charlie be able to work as a wizardry. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, first of all, we're going to be doing a 
presentation um, that gives a little bit of context to this um, sculpture, um, the set and setting, a little bit of the history, et cetera. So those of you who are sitting way back, you may want to come forward because the screen is, you know, it's definitely not a Hollywood screen. And um, yeah, we're, I'm Dorian Kraft, I'm the Executive Director of Burlington City Arts. I'm delighted to be here. I did come for dinner, you guys were amazing. Mm -hmm. And I did also get to speak to some of your children who have gone home, so. Oh, no, we're in the park. Community tonight. Um, as I said, I think if the presentation is an opportunity for us to be able to take you back um, a year and a half ago, actually almost two years ago, into the pandemic when the planning for uh, the sculpture began. Um, a little bit about the relationship between the three departments in the city that are working on this project, um, our relationship to different aspects of it, and then really to listen to you and to, after you've seen this in context, maybe there's a little bit more light than heat, and we can see what the concerns are, take them in, kind of play it, bring it back into our team. Um, and it's fine. We also are doing a larger community meeting at IAA on the 5th of December at 5 or 5.30? 5 to 6.30. 5 to 6.30. So please join us and if uh, your neighbors, we'd love to, we'll do our best to get the word out as well. So um, I'm going to turn it over so everybody here tonight can say who they are. What we're going to do for you. Hi, everybody. My name is Pitka Moivan. I'm with RID, um, Interim Director, and so happy to be here. Before this, I was the NPA Engagement Manager and at the City of Sam. Uh, but yeah, thank you for having us. And definitely, we're, we're going to present on just the concept and goals of what we were discussing this program. Hi, my name is Katie Green. I'm also with the REAB, um, and I am responsible for developing and facilitating our anti-racism training program. I'm Colin Storrs. Um, I work in public art through Burlington City Arch. Hi, I'm Sophie Silvey. I'm the Parks Comprehensive Planner, so I work with the Department of Parks, Recreation, and Waterfront. Hi there, I'm John Adams Collins. I'm a project manager with Burlington Parks Recreation and Waterfront. And then um, on your screen, um, people who are part of this presentation as well, Sarah Katz is here, lower right. And uh, Sarah is the deputy director at Burlington City Arts. Uh, and IQ Open, um, the artist of Embrace and Belonging, is also with us this evening. Thank you and welcome. Okay, so we are going to start with a little bit of context to help frame this project. Um, there we go. Okay, so in the summer of 2021, uh, the REIB. Uh, put out a call for proposals for a, uh, a landmark to go um, in a public space that would signify the RIB's commitment to racial equity. Um, and this project was imagined and, and, and built in the context of the, the um, sort of national movement to, uh, to take down some of the, the racist statues and landmarks and, and replace them with uh, more representative landmarks and um, other forms of uh, anti-racism. Uh, and, and what's more also, this uh, also, excuse me, I lost my place. Um, and additionally, black and brown groups have been historically um, kept out of spaces of belonging, especially public spaces. Um, and so this was a really um, important framework of why we started to develop this project. Um, so we have a few project, we have a few project priorities that were important to us. Um, one of the ones that was the biggest uh, part of our consideration is 
We wanted it to be in a diverse neighborhood, um, to be beneficial to the community, to be a central location, um, and to be a focal point where there's a lot of community activity. And some of the places that we considered were Oak Ledge Park, the waterfront, the Old North End, um, and we ultimately decided to place this landmark in the Old North End because of its rich history, um, because there are a lot of local businesses that are BIPOC owned, and then also its diverse community as well. And so we had considered a few locations in the old, old, excuse me, old North End, the first of which was Community Park. Um, and we, uh, we found that this was a space for active recreation, used for larger gatherings. Um, and this, we ultimately uh, did not decide to use this space because it is such a recreational space and sort of tucked away. Um, so the landmark would be as visible. And we also considered um, Pocket Park, and here we already found that there was limited space for any landmark that would be placed there, and was already a pretty big one there to begin with. Um, okay. So, okay. So. Um, we decided then to go with June Park, um, and the REIB had considered, as we noted, several spaces in Burlington, um, and we chose Dewey Park um, based on the following um, sheet. Oops, sorry, thank you. Um, so this was named for John Dewey, who was um, a progressively fought for civil rights, um, including educational freedom, women's suffrage, um, and this is also, as we noted, located in a diverse uh, part of the community. And we really wanted this to be a place where we could place the landmark and have it represent a metaphorical and physical crossroad in this area. And, and it's also um, a gathering point. Uh, one of the ways people are gathering is through the farmer's market as well. And uh, this was also an opportunity to interact with art, especially since there's the Arts Academy across the way. Um, and then the openness of the park means that the monument will be visible from all around the park. Um, and so then this is creating a landmark about diversity, inclusion, and belonging in the community. And these are the ethos that frame the work that we do at the REID. And so therefore we found this to be a really significant um, public history and uh, project directly. Okay, okay excuse this me. Is a test. Can you uh, hear me? Ivy, did you just, just did you tell us what that meant at the beginning of your evening? Oh, um, yes, yeah. R E I B. Oh yeah, sorry about that. I just see that every day, so I was, you know, I I should I should know to say it out. It's the racial equity inclusion and belonging department um, at the city of Burlington. So thank you for that clarification. Before you move on to the um, background on the parks. I know people would like to know why this felt park wasn't considered, why Battery Park wasn't considered, all, also places in our. Why we, there's people who would also like to know why Battery Park wasn't considered and Roosevelt Park wasn't considered. Bigger places, also places of diversity, also parts of older men. So I appreciate you sharing the background of those other parks that you chose not to do. Um, but could you please talk about them? Remaining parks that were not considered, and why? Yeah. Um, yeah. In the end, it came down to uh, three parks that um, were considered in the old North End, and that's when uh, the Parks Department was um, um, brought in. Um, the three finalists were Pomeroy, or Pomeroy, um, Roosevelt, and Dewey. And um, we did a tour with uh, REIB members, uh, there were community members, um, and chose Dewey because um, of its uh, presence in the, in the heart of the Old North End, it being a very prominent crossroads. Um, 
in the old north end, a gathering spot, in a, a place really where the, the sculpture could be a real focal point. I think Pomeroy is sort of hidden. Roosevelt is um, large and not really um, surrounded by, you know, closely by, by homes and uh, there's no school. Um, Boys and Girls Club is there, of course, but um, yeah, that's, that's what came down to the final choices. Aubrey. Aubrey is a larger park um, and will be going, undergoing a comprehensive planning process in the next few years. And we felt that it needed to go through that larger process to look at it a, as a whole, rather than as um, one part of the park. And, and it already has some art in it. Thank you. So I, I'm going to chat out with a question here. I mentioned uh, earlier with my comments to the DPD regarding the recent project and outreach, how I received a letter in the mail advising me that the work was going to be performed. So sort of if you could kind of explain what kind of outreach was done to the residents in the immediate neighborhood and I guess the three or, or four parks that were ultimately the finalists in the old North End to let them know that, hey, you know, your park and your immediate neighborhood was under consideration to host this sculpture that we're doing. I'm just wondering, you talk a little more about how you um, work with the local immediate residents in the neighborhood. I was hoping we'd do the presentation <laughs> before we took the questions. I was hoping you'd listen to the whole presentation before we took questions so that people would have more of the context of what did take place. Is that okay if we finish and then we take questions? Uh, we are running right on time with the agenda now, so we have about 10 minutes left for this. And, um, I don't know how many, uh, how much time it take to finish the proposal. Probably five minutes. Okay. Thanks. Um, Sarah? Can, can you hear me? You can, we can hear you. You're going to have to speak really close to your computer. Uh, I have my, okay. Can't get any closer than these guys. So. Um, BCA worked closely with REIB to create a call to artists that met the goals of the project that they um, described earlier in this presentation. Um, the selection panel um, was convened that was comprised of community members from the Old North End, representatives from the um, Old North End Farmers Market, students engaged with REIB um, and other community members. And there was a focus on BIPOC participation given the uh, uh, focus of the project goals. We had 38 artists submit qualifications um, and the selection panel read all of those applications and narrowed it down to five finalists who um, submitted in-depth proposals and were interviewed um, extensively by that panel. And Humanity Memorial, who's here with us today, I, I too and um, Bill Hopin were here today to, and they were selected because their project conceptually met all of the goals that um, were laid out in that call to artists. It creates a memorable landmark at this important time in history. It complemented the existing activities um, in the location, made, made a special uh, focus on making sure that the farmer's market would still be able to function as it, as it had. Um, it was an engaging project. It, invited, it invites users to participate through its seating and through open space. It's a uh, piece that is um, open for walking through, for seating, for um, encouraging participation from all, all users of the park. And it provided an opportunity for messaging that really transcended language, which was an important um, conversation that came up in the panel. How do we um, create something that is accessible to everyone? Um, and of course, the artist team that was selected has um, extensive experience working in public art and public spaces. So that's turning it over to I too. Hi, hi everyone. I'm so glad to have the opportunity to talk to all of you because I'm thinking about you since uh, the beginning of the project. So I want you all know that I created with you in my mind, with the community in my heart, because I just so inspired by the story and by the diversity of the community. That's why I applied for this project. And that's how 
we create from the inspiration from you, from the community. And I'm also personally, I'm a daughter of a farmer. I understand so well how community raised me up. And I know this is all about connection and from the community, for the community. So when I design this piece, I have a very warm feeling about this space. And I feel the space itself inspired. The community is in, itself inspired, embraced. So I think the location and the art is inseparable because the art is about the soul of the community, about love, about how we embrace one another, how we embrace all the beautiful diversity, uh, culture, and uh, as a quick of uh, America. It's beauty of diversity. And that's how this piece as a message will be so important to give our children, uh, the school children nearby. And that's another important factor inspired this piece because this piece is about a timeless message about how, what we going to value uh, to, to show the role model of unity to our children. So it is a timeless piece. And this is so important to reflect who we are in this beautiful communi community wave waved places. So it's not in a big park and will not get lost because this is about the people and reflect the spirit of your community. And it was a big piece, I think, will we'll, we'll fit in a space. Yeah. It, you know, uh, there's a saying that we have in the industry that sculpture gives meaning to a space. But in this case, I think the space itself helped give meaning to the sculpture. The, this was, was created from the ground up. It's not landing from the sky. This space is important and central to the community and it created the work. And like I Chu said, if you took this piece and put it out in a, a wide open field, it would get lost, it would almost disappear. But this space is a room that captures it. And it's also a room that's very special to the community. And the embracing of that room gives meaning to the sculpture, then it bounces back on the sculpture and gives more meaning to this. What is now a lawn will become a plaza, a meeting spot, a landmark. Okay, so thank you for that. I think we all understand the value of the project and of the sculpture. Um, I think the, the issue with people here in Burlington is that it's an inappropriate size for the size of the park. Am I, am I wrong about that? Is there anyone from the farmer's market here that can give us an opinion on their, could you please come forward? Okay, so again, no one's really questioning the, the, the value of the, of the sculpture. Hi folks, my name is Jean Wolf. I live at 38 Spring Street, right across from me. I also work at Dots Market, right across from me. I appreciate everything you've done. Now, realistically, we all live in the real world. It's a very beautiful piece. I appreciate it. I appreciate all your work. Has anybody thought about the crime? Has anybody thought about how much lectures you've got to pay for it? Because it's going to be lit up. It's going to be like it's the outlet they put there. Nobody talked about how much my property the real world. Is my property value going to go up because of your sculpture? Like a few more taxes on them? This is the first time for a moment here. I've rented for 30 something years, and I'm scared to death of what this could be viewed as I see on a daily basis. And I don't know. I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, but if some reality is going to get pretty hard. So, how much will it cost they fit if it gets broken or damaged? Because we ultimately all pay for it no matter what. And I work very, very hard, and I don't have my food. Oh, okay. Thank you. Is there, any, is there anyone else here that wants to comment about the size of the sculpture as opposed to the size of the park? 
Because that was my understanding that that's what the issue was. Okay. I'm just curious how it's going to, um, and it's a beautiful sculpture, and I'm curious how it's going to coexist with the farmer's market there. Thank you. So the farmer's market is not here because they were earlier, and the farmer's market. Ben, ben Taylor, the manager. Can you speak to it? Yep. Thank you. It's <laughs> Ben. So I'm Ben Rogers, and Farmers Market. I also work for the City of Burlington Parks Department. Um, I, I was not aware of the sculpture, and um, when I first learned about it, I was initially excited about the idea because I thought that a new public art piece to one of my favorite parks um, was another reason to gather there, another reason to bring people in, another uh, reason to look at that park in a nice, nice way. Um, I was surprised by the size of it, and I think the piece that was um, most surprising to me was just the way it was um, selected. You know, when you want a community park to feature a piece from someone from the community. Um, but when things like this happen, I know that you know it's, it's sometimes out of people's control, and I know that this was sort of more so an opportunity to come together like this to talk about how we can re-envision that space. And so, if there's a sculpture coming in, I think that. That's a great thing. We have to think critically how we can have the farmers market and have um, you know the surrounding community exist in cohesion and harmony. And so um, I'm excited to keep talking about this. I'd love to think about you know how the siting and the placement can live in cohesion with the farmers market and also with perhaps some more um, plantings or seeding um, or public uh, fruit trees or fruit shrubs. Um, mm -hmm. And so. Uh, yeah, I think I'm just going to keep talking about how we can make this sculpture happen that fits the needs of, of everyone that needs assistance. I also just want to acknowledge that Hillary from the Farmers Market sat on the selection committee um, with other members of the community and was part of the decision to choose this piece to be in this park. Um, so they were was a lot more engagement with a larger group than in an earlier time. I think one of the things that um, is so important and maybe so hard to convey by these visual images, and we've been trying all day to alter some of the photographs to give you a better sense of how it is when you're actually standing within the park, within the sculpture, the transparency that there is within, and the ability to walk through it and to sit on a bench and watch um, the light come through in so many different ways and during hot days for it to create shade and a place to gather and to sit, um, as well as to um, very much center the farmer's market as one of the most important activities that takes place in the park. And we really thought this sculpture would uplift and give a new meaning and perhaps even new ideas that would come out from the engagement with this piece. And that's what good public art does, is it not only um, gives meaning to the space and um, marries that, but also um, engenders new activities and new ways that the community can engage through um, the relationship to, to those pieces. Um, um, I'd love to interrupt to just to ask what your plans are for engagement. That word was really good. I think um, the biggest, uh, I mean, Andrea Todd, I've been emailing face to the big emails that have been going around. I'm, I'd love, I have heard back from um, some of my most recent requests for information. I was really glad that you're here. I also think you may have told me that it's really grateful that you're having a uh, December 5th meeting. Um, and I think that I would like, like the project to be really. How do we start it in terms of public engagement? Because what's not been presented tonight are the levels of public engagement that have come to lead up to this point. Um, there hasn't been an, an, a request from the community if we wanted it to be part. There was a, I think that that's a really important piece that has been missing. And I think, um, during to your point, like Hillary was part of that, um, that committee, but nobody in that committee knew what the size and scale of this was, and they voted for it. 
Um, what I think the community also wants to see are things like a footprint map so that we can see where this looks, where this will be, how tall this will be. I think I'm trying to do renditions, but what we want to see is like, this is this square footage, as I understand it from the farmer market, 20 square feet and 20 feet high is really dominating. Um, so many other questions that I've had that I want to make sure I convey to this evening are, can the concrete be considered? It's considered a public right of way, is what we were told at the farmer's market the last day. Um, again, these are things that need to be coming from a public process that really hasn't been robust in any way. I hate to call it robust because it isn't overly generous. Um, I think the process that you went through to select the art and the art is beautiful, I think is not skewed here, but for me, the really the important piece that is very much missing is um, the inclusivity and diversity of the engagement. This project is meant to represent inclusivity and diversity, and it has not been diverse in the way that it has reached into the community or asked the community what its needs or wants. Um, and so I think um, another piece that's missing is who to contact about this. Um, until last week, there was no link for us to see. Now we have a BCA link, so thank you for putting that up there. But where, who, are we, who are we to be speaking with if people have questions? Um, it's three departments. I've heard people say, that's an REIB BCA project. Uh, we, we aren't in charge of that. That's the park side of things. These are sort of a lot of mixed messages that are being sent to the community about how this project is kind of moving forward. Um, so I think the bigger question is, can we can we sort of start over in terms of not the part, but in terms of the process? Because this is really feeling like a project that's been foisted upon the community versus a project that is being embraced by the community. And that is the project project today is includes the working place and it really hasn't um, embraced the community's needs or the community's uh, concerns because even putting something of a 20 foot by 20 foot by 20 foot on that park is going to drastically impact the farmer's market. We'd like to know have people observed the farmer's market. 20, 20 weeks or so the farmer's market went by and there was one public moment of an explanation of what was happening on the final day of, of the market when there were the least number of people in the community to, to see this happening. Um, so I would, I would really like to ask that this project be um, sort of taken back and ask, if, if we wanted to do this right, and I think we all really want this to be successful, um, can we have this taken back to a point where we say, yeah, we're going to, if we are actually going to select a new park, can we make it on the concrete side? And if it's going to take a long time for that concrete to be turned into the proper zoning area, then let's take that time. But I think there's a lot of moving pieces that haven't been kind of laid out for the community and seem to be happening without um, work on. And so I think that if we can, hopefully by December 15th, Thing. Um, I think that would be really wonderful. I think that's in fact the first publicly announced meeting for that for this process. Again, I think we want to be moving forward and have like some robust ideas for what are the points of public engagement. A lot of people at that market on the last day, they were looking at those pictures and there were English language bullets. There were no foreign language bullets trying to reach 40 languages in this community to try to explain what is happening. So Again, so it's just an exclusion of the community who can't understand what is going into their parks. So I think um, I, I really am grateful that, that the community want, we want to give this to the community. Um, I think the project is beautiful. Um, I think public art is beautiful, but I think that it needs to come with a very respectful process. And I don't feel like that. Yeah. Does anyone have any other comments? Um, if I could just respond a little bit to that, I would say that after our evening and engagement um, uh, at the last farmer's market, we were it was very clear that we were getting some feedback about scale, about location, about layout, and uh, there was already a plan underway to um, schedule a meeting. 
uh, with representatives from the farmers market, from the community about how we could work this in a way um, that was workable and uh, really symbiotic um, in terms of how all of it can, can work together. Um, so I would encourage everyone here to just, you know, take a couple of steps back and be willing to um, look at that again in a way with fresh eyes um, and maybe even try to celebrate the idea that this sculpture could become a, a well-known landmark in your neighborhood and it would symbolize something that maybe um, we're feeling like we're pushing aside or pushing to another park. And um, it is a neighborhood park, it is a small park, but it is a park that belongs to everyone in the city, just like every other park in the city belongs to everyone. And I would just ask that you consider some of those things. I just want to respond to Andrea because um, I do agree that a robust invasion of process is not how I would describe this. And in so many ways, when there is a robust project uh, and engagement process, it is linked in to a large project that's part of something that's bigger. And this was a standalone project run by multiple departments who had not worked together in this way before. It was COVID, it was racial reckoning, it was the REIB department that wanted to move to bring this to Juneteenth to get it to the community as a gift in um, the fastest way possible. And I think what we're hearing tonight is a desire to as you said, to step back and to look at it with fresh eyes and to imagine what, what it can be. Um, and I think we'll do that at the meeting on the 5th. Um, we will work hard at um, some of the drawings and in any other way that we can to sort of give the feel of what this is gonna feel like to walk through because I think some of the drawings and certainly some of the early drawings really the scale just was overwhelming. And I think many people who responded negatively have seen some of the newer pictures and said, oh my God, it's such a different, what happened? Did you just shrink the piece? Mm -hmm. The answer is no, it's still 20 feet. As the selection committee did select, by the way, they knew the scale of the, of the project when it was selected. So yes, we, we, uh, you know, we humbly submit there should be a better process, let's do it. Um, thank you very much for, for coming out. Um, I love this community as you do. And I think that um, all of us in the three departments really care to get this right. Um, and we have the capacity to do that. And it just may be, mean, it may take a little longer, that's all. Thank you. Any further comments or questions? Yeah. Hi, I'm Megan Humphrey, and I wanna just get out everything that Andrew has said. Um, I also have sent letters to lots of you, and I'm an artist. I think public art is hugely important, and I appreciate that, and I appreciate everyone's work. Um, but I also have some concerns. I would have been Andrea, but maybe saw it on the half of last week, and it was just shocking to be honest with you. Um, and so, what happens there at a farmer's market um, is that there can be kids that are over from the school. There was a library program, a childcare center, and the entire park is filled off. And as Andrea said, that was the last day, so there weren't even the number of vendors that would typically be there. But it's all the rest of the time, too, that I'm worried about. It's um, a public, very public space. It's utilized by lots of people who are just hanging out or classes come over from across the street. And Certainly part of my concern is that 55% of that school is minority, and I think it's something like 40 languages are spoken there, and I don't know how they were included in the process, which would have also been really great. So I do love the design, but I, I just think it's too large for that space, for that tiny pocket part when 
It's like a thoroughfare through there. It's a direct line for lots and lots of people who are going down to them. Um, and then I guess on top of everything else that's been said, my other concern is about electricity being put into that part specifically for that sculpture. And if I'm wondering, the climate crisis and so I'm concerned that we're using electricity in addition and the cost of that would um, get included in as well. So thank you very much. I was going to question the comment. Thanks for giving us some context on that. Um, which, yeah, I agree. The context has been missing. Um, I was at the last part of the market, and it was a shock to me, too. Um, I think having a sign in the park would have been helpful. Like, this is where something is coming, just so people who are in the park are going to come. I've seen that happen further and public sort of things. And yeah, my main concern is the fall off the green space that's used at the bottom of the market. And there's a whole bunch of hardscape. And then we talked about it at the, the on the day. Um, and, and it, I understand there is a difficulty with utilizing that hardscape, but it just seems kind of replacing green space with hardscape where there could be a trade seems like more space to me. So yeah, my two concerns are the, the green things and the outage was was good laughing. But thanks for coming to the pilot. I wish Garrett was here because I um, he would have told us exactly how much it's going to be to run those LEDs, and I think it's like under ten dollars a year is the is the cost of it. But I'm not gonna thank you, Mark and Janet. Hi, um, I think the two points I want to bring together are um, I love the support for redefining the farmer's market thing, and I love the support for the farmer's market idea. So I hope that people will still vote for it, and I wonder what the process will be. So if people vote for it in this process, and then we do a different process, I hope that's possible. And they don't know if you have it figured out. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'm clear to what the um, People are voting. I understand people are voting for funding for these things. No. 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 Voting for prioritizing it. That's what I'm saying. I came on just lately and I think I don't care. Well, yeah, this, this, really this was already selected, it's in production. And it's not part of the voting board of, of uh, the board to increase mm -hmm. funding. This is so this is your this is funding for this came from our lady. So the so the balance here is not related. I'm related. Okay. I didn't get that. Thank you. Not any question. Thank you. If you guys want to make any final comments here before we wrap up and move on to the, the next part of the agenda? Yeah, uh, this is Kit from my event, Mario. I just want to say thank you all um, for all these um, ideas and suggestions and comments because it really is important for our city departments to know. And the intent of this um, monument isn't about providing the the community. So we'll take that seriously. You know, and so we're going to take back the comments and the feedback and do an engagement process and be much more inclusive and robust um, communities. And so we're hoping to have more diversity. It's like a panel when we did put it together, was a um, mostly BIPOC community from the old North End. But we hear you on like your concerns, and it is important for us to know that. The farmers market is a staple in the whole north end. Mm -hmm. um, but we want to consider, yeah, definitely the little bus of the whole community of the NPA and also the um board soon as a whole. So um, today is just a start of a discussion. So and we do welcome, you know, for you all to kind of get the summer kit and invite your friends and those who are not part of the farmers market, those who are 
um, identify as immigrants or refugees or are not attending the NPAs because we do want to hear a whole like a whole scope of feedback. Is there a point person? Is there a point email that you can direct um, us to so that there's one? Is there one solid place for us to reach out to or to look for information? Um, I have been functioning as a point person for this project, so my email is c stores so c s p o r r s at Burlington City Arts dot org, and I'm happy to field the questions for the public people that way. Thank you, Paul. Okay. All right, we're going to be we're running a little behind schedule right now, so we feel like we're going to move on to the next portion. Excellent. We're going to roll on this one. We're going to have all the uh, ran out and they just come up, give a two minute speech about their um, application, and then what gives them an opportunity to speak. We'll have entertain questions before we're going to have individual applications. That's good. There's any like that. Yeah. Yeah. At some point, we should have just explained the process so that they understand the work. Just because I didn't do a great job of explaining it during the meeting. So, why don't we give them time to do that? Yeah. Um, so, while we're going to have all of the NPA grant applicants come up to the front and be ready to do your two minute feel. Um, and while they're coming up, I'll just explain how the, how the grant process and how it works, and then I'll pass it over to this committee. So, um, for those of you who, who might not have heard the Territory Community Dinner, um, this is a community grant process. So, each of the neighborhood planning assemblies in the city um, gets $2,500 each year to spend as they see fit. Here in Wards 2 and 3 for the past couple of years, um, we've done community grants as a way to be the last one. Uh, have the community decide how this money is spent and to have. To have some some uh, to the community province. And so I just want to make sure that everyone understands the criteria for these grants and what, what things can be funded. Um, so the funded projects must adhere to the city's rules for any case you can fund, and that's available online. Um, they okay. need to benefit wards two and or and or three residents, increase community cohesion. Um, and or support the operation and purpose of the neighborhood planning assembly. The projects must, the funded projects must be accessible and or include a diversity of community members and also recognize the NPA in some, in some way. Uh, and so we had 10 applications this year, which was amazing, a really wide range of projects that you're going to hear about in just a moment. Um, and so each person is going to have two minutes. We do have one person on Zoom, I believe. Um, uh, Jessica Wislowski is on Zoom, she's waving. And then we did have a video submitted by Alex Hall. Um, and and um, and then there's also one of, uh, is Stuart, Stuart Sport here? One person? Oh, so there, uh, there are two people who are not able to be here, so I'll just read read their, their pieces very quickly. And so what's really important is how you vote. So you can vote in two ways. You can vote here today, there are these uh, beige pieces of paper um, that are your ballots, uh, or you can vote online. Uh, and the link to the voting for those of you in the, on screen is on the agenda, or you can go to https dot slash slash findingurl dot com slash NPA grants 2022. But if you go to the agenda for this meeting, there'll be, there'll be a link there, as well as all the information, the full application. I really encourage you to read through the full application. You're only going to get a few minutes of, of, of presentation today, and I want you to, to understand what all the projects are about. And then when you vote, what we're asking you to do is a recommendation. We want to hear from you should each of these amazing projects be fully funded, partially funded, or not funded at all. You don't have to worry about how much. So uh, we have about $4,500 to spend, but there's about over $7,000 in requests. Um, all we want to know from you is what you think we should do. Should we fully fund, partially fund, or, or not fund? And then the steering committee is going to take all that information, everything that comes from the paper ballot, everything that comes from the online voting. Online voting will be open um, and, until November 18th, so there's plenty of time to make your vote, and we'll be putting more information out about that. And then we'll figure out how we can fund as much as possible based on all of your recommendations. Um, 
But one question that came up is, do I vote for one project or do I vote for them all? You vote for all of them. You put your rent your, your recommendation for each of the projects. It's also important to know that this is a one vote, one person, one vote process. We're trusting everyone to respect that. So if you vote today, don't go online, vote again. If you vote online, if you vote online, don't do paper one uh, because we want to make this as fair as possible. Um, so I think that's the, the overview. And then what we'll do, we'll, uh, you want to do the yeah, I think we'll introduce Mark in the file the order that's on the paperwork is distributed to make it easy so folks can follow along. So first the project thing we have up is not during a one night art festival. So uh, this thank you. And, and I have a two minute timer. Yeah. Two minute timer. Okay. Okay, so it's better to just see the little changes and kind of things that I need to do. Okay. Good. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Sam. Um, I'm a dancer and a filmmaker, and I live at Eagleville Ave. Hi, I'm Olivia, and I'm a chef, and I live in for the Philippines. And we are interested in making a one night immersive arts festival that would feature dance, film, poetry, music, installation, sculpture. And what you said, the five times in the region. Um, the event would be called Nocturne, uh, and they would happen in the old event in the spring and future local events. Um, so, this event will bring together artists and provide like a cohesive organization for them to connect and share their art. Um, it will provide them with a platform and resources for their art. Um, it will benefit Ward 2 and 3 by providing a vibrant space for people to come and connect over art and connect with their neighbors and all create the art. And we're thinking critically about how to make this accessible for both participating artists and for festival goers. Um, so our plan is to have a proposal, uh, an application poster that we have in multiple languages, and we'll distribute both digitally and physically around the community. We are planning to charge for tickets to the event, depending on the tickets. And this, we thought a lot about this, that the, the ticket, um, Funds would uh, be distributed evenly for the participating artists, and this is a way to make it both accessible for artists and for community members. So, um, we really want to be able to pay artists who are participating if we believe that art is value and that artists should be paid. Um, but at the same time, no one would be turned away for lack of funds. So, if someone can't pay who wants to come, they'll also be able to come through. Um, and so we're requesting $750, and the intention is that that would go towards like space rental, equipment rentals, um, as well as our supplies. We're hoping that there would be like a few components or ingredients as well. Um, we would include the NPA in our application, as well as like our festival um, materials and partners, um, and also in our NPA support. Thank you all so much. <laughs> Farmers Market with Ben Rogers. Hello, hey everybody. Um, ben Rogers, I am the market manager for the North and Farmers Market. I also work for the City of Rhodes and Parks Department, and I'm at Decatur Street Residence. Um, I am here specifically to request $750 to be used for the upcoming Farmers Market season. Um, I stepped into this role in August when the previous manager stepped out, but I've been volunteering with the market for a few years. And um, there's obviously going to be some big changes going on to the park this coming year. And so uh, we've been working um, to think of how we can re-envision that space. And that is going to perhaps include a sculpture, but also include plantings for uh, fruit trees, native plants, shrubs, uh, trees for canopy cover and shade. And then we also want to improve our signage and outreach. And so we are specifically looking to create signage that is going to be outreaching the diverse community in different languages to um, engage the community in what types of, um, you know, how the market provides EBT and SNAP benefits, and also just that the open farmers market exists. As the community continues to be diversified, we'd love to see that at the market too. Um, and then the last piece we are looking to do is um, improve outreach through social media, um, utilizing uh, Edward Warrior's wonderful um, artistry. And so we've been actively talking about how to make that happen. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Janet. All right, next up we have the Old North End Band Nepali Ceremony Class and Performances. Let me just say right. one thing first. So people should understand when they make their presentation that far, far, far more people are going to see this online than are here tonight. Hundreds and hundreds of people are going to see it. Thank Hello. you. <laughs> Thank oh, you, Brian. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, I'm Brian Perkins. I work with the uh, Old North End Neighborhood Band, the One Band, and in a number of other capacities. I run the One Saints program at Integrated Arts Academy, and uh, a number of musical education programs, all devoted to providing musical training and performance opportunities for young people in our community. So um, the the one the Old North End Neighborhood Band um, is teenagers playing the music um, of the immigrant communities of the Old North End, and that includes just um, dozens and dozens of cultures who brought their music and their families to our community over the past 200 or so years. And that repertoire is within here. And so the ensemble plays music from uh, this repertoire. So access to musical education for young people is an extremely uh, critical issue. And we have numerous screening processes whereby uh, people from our neighborhood and our community are filtered out of musical education opportunities. And so a lot of the programs that I work with are uh, brought together by the desire to make sure that young people have uh, are not screened out and they have numerous entry points into uh, learning music and performing and being the voice of their community. So the, this is the Nepali Sarangi. This is an iconic instrument within the Nepali community. Um, and so there's a training program that I'm running and with um, assistance from a couple sources to make sure that young people have access to training and performance opportunities and access to instruments upon which to play. So an extremely uh, important and targeted project. And so um, this dovetails with the program of teaching the Sarangi at Integrated Arts Academy. I will be, uh, if this grant is funded to uh, $750, I will be providing um, classes on the Sarangi in a central location, provided free for young people. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Next up is the Old North End Dance Festival. Alex. Alex, you online? Is that, is that me? Uh, since Alex isn't here, we'll read the short description. Um, so the Old North End Dance Festival is a celebration of art, culture, and our bodies in late, that will be held in late May, early June at Roosevelt Park uh, with three components. Uh, performance component, showcasing the breadth of talent of dance artists in the Old North End. Uh, workshops uh, for all levels, all generations, and uh, movement classes taught by performing artists and a dance party with the DJ, so we can interview together with the live DJ. The uh, event would, would be free and be organized by Alex Paul and the tennis court in my case. So since Alex has been here to talk about the project, I'd encourage everyone to read through the details um, that are submitted. Thank you, Jess. All right, next up is the Everyday Neighbors 2023 Multiple Community Wall Calendar with Ivan Clipstein. Hey everybody, how's it going? Great. My name is Ivan. I'm a um, illustrator and musician. I live in Ward Three over here on Park Street. And um, so this was just a little uh, projects that I've had an idea for. And this is like not a calendar involved, but this is you know we're, we're familiar with this type of thing. Um, techno service. This is not really my project that I came across the other day. So, you know, it's a 12 month calendar. I'm proposing a 13 month calendar with an extra January at the end for those of us that tend to, you know, act a little late and get to the next year's calendar. Um, I write better than I speak, and I had more time to write my thing than two minutes. But basically, 
Um, I've done a lot of projects the last few years documenting just human life in our neighborhood. Uh, I did a book called Emerald Moon Over Dirty Lake, which is a lot of drawings of just like everyday people and places. Um, there was only 100 copies of that. One of them is in the Library of Congress, which is kind of cool. And um, so for this, I was thinking, let's go color. Like these are my old drawings. Maybe we can zoom in on these um, from the last project. Um, I like to make drawings that include just everybody who's around, which is kind of like what one of the nicest things about our neighborhood is. Um, the main idea for the calendar is that it's a multilingual calendar, and I have not seen that before, but I would like to make that um, just as basically like a really useful um, piece of everyday art that people can have in a home that might even you know feature the names of the months and the days of the week in their language. And I know that there's, as we've spoken about some of the other issues today, you know, there's 40 some languages in the neighborhood. And this is gonna kind of try to hone in on the top 15 or so. And I think we're at time basically. Um, thanks for listening to my project. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Okay. I want to ask, will you just come along with me for a minute here? Imagine it's May. Okay. Okay. I want to ask, will you just come along with me for a minute here? Imagine it's May, so that late spring, almost summer feeling, and you're walking outside your house. What is the urge in your body? Perhaps there's some energy within you that wants to dance or move in some way. And maybe you do or maybe you don't, but say you take a walk downtown and you encounter someone at the park who is dancing. Do you not smile? I know I definitely do. My name's Alex Cobb. I'm a dance artist and teacher, and I want to create an event called the Old North End Dance Festival to celebrate art, culture, and our bodies. This event will bring us together to connect and do something joyful. It will be at Roosevelt Park, so it's in our public spaces. And I really believe that dance is something we can all connect with. It transcends language, it exists in every human culture, and it's just fun. So there's three parts that I envision. First, is performance to showcase the incredible talent of dance artists in our neighborhood and to create access to dance performance rather than it being on a stage in a theater where you need a ticket just next door at the park. Second is workshops. So the audience not only gets to witness the art of the dancers, but gets to engage and learn with them. And third is a dance party just for us to groove and have a great time. So with the funds of the NPA grant, I can equitably compensate about four dance artists to perform and teach. I will also, if awarded this grant, seek additional funding so I can invite more artists and have a greater representation of dance styles, forms, backgrounds. Also hire a DJ and maybe get some tasty snacks and non-alcoholic beverages. So this is my vision and my proposal. I'm grateful for you for listening and considering this idea and I'll see you around. Thank you.
file. All right. Next up is the fresh press mini press mini pet number two. Hello. Okay. 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 Earlier this fall, we were first Fred Kemp's mini fest. Uh, myself and Alice spent two months planning that out, and we paid for it online for the pumpkins. Uh, we had a massive turnout. We had almost 300 people show up in the venue we built in our backyard. Um, we had people from all walks of life, families, uh, older people, younger people. It was really cool, and we really realized that this thing that we started uh, was really building that sense of community that we wanted in the musical community. And so what we're looking for is the grant that's $750 to throw another mini fest. And the money would go to hiring the bands for the mini fest. And the idea was uh, the admission fee would be about $10 um, would go towards uh, benefiting a nonprofit, which would be really cool and really help the sense of community. And we would include everybody. We have a sign up sheet. We want local artists, vendors, and uh, food vendors to come and just hang out, listen to music, uh, maybe support their businesses. Last but we had a couple of ruler makers that did really well, really cool. And so, just focusing on that is really building a sense of community. Burlington has a massive music scene and a ridiculous band per capita. It's one of the biggest I've ever seen. And so, so there's always new bands looking to expand and do something. And it's really great for the community because music brings everybody together. It's something we all kind of have in common. Um, I think it would be really important for uh, this community, especially, uh, to do something like this. And everybody else has some really amazing ideas. And as I was listening to everybody, I thought it was really cool to incorporate almost every single one together. For another thing, it's a lot. Thank you. Our next project is Meryl. Let's talk about blank. And that would be Jessica Wasowski. She is on Zoom. All right. Hey. Thank you. All right. Does the audio come across okay? Yes. All right. I'm going to try sharing a screen too, if that's all right. Um, share. Okay, I just wanted to show you pictures as well. My name is Jess Wozlowski. I'm the school librarian at Sustainability Academy. We have about 190 students. I'm really sorry I can't be there in person tonight. Um, we're applying for full funding to install a mural in our library, which is a busy common space at this school. Murals are an opportunity for time marking and storytelling, and they can quickly establish a sense of joy for people in a new space. Here's why we need this. When I began teaching at Sustainability Academy, nothing was normal for the children. I started in the fall of 2020. It was my first year teaching anywhere. Um, inside and outside of the school, everything was, was a kilter. Um, we had learners attending in shifts to keep numbers in the school low. Then when we came back, kindergartners who have come to learn are all about closeness and cuddles. We're always kept six feet apart and they had masks covering their faces all day long. When I taught, instead of kids coming up to the library, I had to go to them. All the books were on a cart and I could only see pods of students every nine or 10 weeks. We were really fragmented as a community. Then last year when I was finally able to host students in the library, I wanted it to be meaningful for them and connective and then give them a choice in making, making some changes to the space to, so it could be comforting for them. Our fifth graders tackled this project of trying to figure out what they would want in their space. And we had one class that entirely studied murals. And uh, these are some of the ways that we studied murals. We did a walking field trip to check out the Moringa mural. Um, and what they told me that was that they wanted a space that affirmed and reflected who they themselves are, affirming Black Lives Matter and LGBTQIA messaging and art and flags. The class that researched muralists found Liza S, who has agreed to work with us on this. They're based in the Old North End and they gravitate toward messages that confront bias and assumptions 
and they reaffirm the value of all people. These are pictures of students of ours actually doing their final presentations on various Burlington-based muralists. The MPA funds would help bring us towards our final project. The MPA's role is to give community members a chance to get involved in their neighborhoods, and our students are themselves part of this greater community, as is our library. Having beautiful artwork work will bring joy to all who enter, and those people include Ward 2 and 3 families and community members, Burlington School District after school staff, guest teachers, UVM student teachers, paraeducators, support staff, Shelburne Farm staff, volunteers who come as part of our reading mentor program that brings 20 adults in every week, family translators, school administrators, school board meetings and subcommittees are held there frequently. We have as many as 750 visits to the library recorded on some days. The impact to the students will be strong and it'll help us continue to rebuild our cohesion as a school community and it'll help send a powerful message about who holds decision-making power in our common areas. The answer is all of us. Give me your last thought. Give me your last thought. Huh? Hey, we're way over two minutes, so just give me your final thought. That's it. I'm finished. Okay, thank you. Thank you, President. Uh, the next one up is the uh, new three closed bin at Battery Street Jeans. Uh, request from Stuart Sporco, uh, Sporco at Battery Street Jeans. I don't believe Stuart's able to make it tonight, but it's just what we got online. So, um, the description for the project is a new wooden den outside of the College Street store or three clothes for the community. The city and property management have requested a proper wooden structure to hold the clothes, which benefit all types of people rich, poor, people with families, college kids, people of different cultures, and houseless folks. Um, I just want to say that out of all of the um, different proposals that we've received tonight, this is the only one that would benefit an area of the downtown. And as a downtown resident, I want to attest to this per personally. Um, I see the closed bins out there in front of Battery Street Beans. I know that some of the folks in our own house community, a lot of folks use that. Uh, it's just kind of haphazard scattered. You know, I appreciate the effort, but I think uh, to the city's point um, and to their request, having me up in there would help them. So um, that's my little plug for that. And moving on to the final, second to last announcement, sorry, uh, project, the NPA Explainer Comic Scene, which is uh, Christine Tyler Hill. And Christine's not with us tonight either. So Christine is proposing a 10 panel comic zine that can be distributed both online and in print, and that explains what an NPA voices and perspectives on why the NPA matters and how to locate your own NPA meeting. Printed copies will be distributed locally at sites such as Free Little Libraries, The Ramble, local businesses, the Old North End Farmers Market, and a digital version will be shared on social media via email. Uh, Christina's requesting 750 for her proposal. And then finally, we have the Old North End Repair Cafe from Laboratory Media and the Travis is here. So without further ado. <coughs> I'm Trav, uh, I'm a Ward 2 resident. Um, I'm part of Laboratory B. We're at um, 12 North Street, so North and North. Um, it's a cooperative workspace. We have shared tools. Um, and so the main thing that we do is this repair cafe. It's every third Saturday. We've been doing it for about two and a half years now. Um, and so the, the gist is anything you can carry in will help you fix yourself or will help you fix it or at least give some insight about how it can be fixed. Um, so it's free for anyone to just show up. There's food for volunteers and the grant, we've gotten this NBA grant a few times and um, it's mostly pays for the food and it's also supplies and tools. Um, I think it's a really fun time. We were, the next one is not the day after tomorrow, but a week from Saturday, um, from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. at 12 North Street. So come on down and um, bring some stuff. It's fun to, you know, there's no, no skills or requirements, curiosity. Um, so it's fun and uh, thanks for coming. There's more info at laboratoryb.org slash repair cafe. And that concludes our presentations for the NPA grant application for the current cycle from applicants from both work to the three. A reminder that if you're here tonight, you can vote here if you'd like. And if you vote here, please on your honor, don't vote again online. 
uh, for those of you that are on Zoom and are not able to vote uh, in person, we have the uh, online voting at uh, tinyurl.com forward slash NPA grants 2022 uh, is the URL for that. So uh, without further ado, if anyone has any questions for any of the present presenters on their parent projects, we'll open the floor up for questions. Yes, ma'am. Here. Sorry, I don't want to hold everybody up, but if if we think that every single one of them should be fully funded, we can write that on or not. Uh, I think you can certainly write it on. I'm not sure how the math is going to work on that, but you can certainly vote how, how, how you want. Okay. Because that, that's my question, because if if all of the ballots come back and everyone wants them to be fully fully funded, and then what is going to happen on your end? Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so we're hoping that doesn't happen. But, but if it does, what we would have to do is make a decision to um, probate everyone's everyone's um, request. You know, we would we would reach out to the individual um, applicants to find out whether their project could be successful at all or not. Um, and if not, then it would make sense to them. But if yes, so there might be some conversation. Uh, there has been some voting online already, and not everyone is selected to fully fund all of them. So I, I think that we'll be able to take the broad recommendations of the community and figure out the math to make it work. Um, but if we can't, then we'll be coming back to all of you in December. Uh, but I'm not confident that we can come up with a proposal that honors the desires and recommendations of the of the voting community and funds as many of these projects as make sense. That Thank you again. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, I'm how the acceptable lowering cost first and then how the acceptable. Thanks so much. I forgot to mention that. There's going to be 1,000 copies made. That's my proposal. Um, if we don't raise all the funds we need, it could be a lower quantity. But the important thing that I want to stress is that these will be available for free for anybody in the community I'm going to partner with. All kinds of local businesses and boards and just like small businesses up in the world street, for instance, if they have them on the on the counter or whatnot, the people can just take them all enjoy that. That's it. Thank you, Adam. Any further questions or comments about any proposals? I'm ready to head on. Thanks, <laughs> All right, I think that pretty much wraps up the formal part of our agenda. If anyone wants to sign the card here and leave a note for Jan out of the way out, having done so already, we encourage you to do so. Uh, thanks for being patient with every included attendant who wants to add a schedule, now we're behind and now we're done. Thank you. <laughs>